I'm going to pick up on something that uh, Craig said in one of his answers just now. I really like that phrase about immersing yourself in the world of the customer. And that's what this, uh, my presentation is really about. We've heard quite a bit this week about uh, people talking about whether we should be reporting on conversions uh, by session or whether we should be talking by, about conversions by, uh, by user. And I'm actually going to extend the phrase out a bit and not going to try and talk about conversion by person or people, but I am interested in the idea of talking about people-centered analytics rather than users. Users are trails of data in our systems. I'm saying I want to help you think about how to broaden that out into an understanding of a flesh and blood person and what they are doing on our sites, what they want to do. Uh, I've, last week, Stu McMillan, who is somebody I urge you to follow on Twitter, uh, because he shares so much excellent information about the data, real data, uh, from a big retailer in the UK called Shu. Very worth following. But he came up with this phrase about talking about vis visitor experience rather than session experience. And what I'm drawing from that is this point about, again, broadening about out user experience from just what happens during a session on our site to the whole process, to include, for example, fulfillment. I once turned round a mail order business by optimizing fulfillment rather than anything to do with the process up to that point. Um, I've been doing this for an awful long time, and this subject that I'm talking about is the thing I've been doing for all that time. My primary interest is in what real people are doing, uh, in particular, the aspects of what they're doing online relating to what they want to do, plus what the organization wants them to do, and how those two intersect. And the picture on the bottom there is of a website where I started doing this. This is an early site made for the record industry, made for Virgin Records back in the, the mid-90s. At that point, we were working with log files. And one of the things that we used the log files for was as evidence when we were conducting sort of training sessions and explorator, uh, you know, explorations for people within the recording industry. This is my take. This is how the recording industry used to see uh, their world in those days. For all I know, they still do, but I'm not involved. At the centre was this thing called the artist. Surrounding that was the management. Then there was the record label. And on the outer world was the general public, the fans. And in this representation, those rings might just as well have been sort of impermeable barriers, because in their world, everything was precisely controlled from the center outwards. For example, they used to be able to and did rec you know, release records in different parts of the world at different times so that they could move their promotional activity around the planet. We had to use the data to show them that their notions no longer applied in this new world. If somebody linked to a page deep within the site that was about uh, the new records and skipped the old record discography or skipped the tour dates, that was tough, that was the new world, which was hard for them to get their heads around. And I would argue that although it sounds as if we're in a different world now, to a large extent, we haven't moved on that far. One of the things I mentioned there is, of course, we were working with log files, but very, very soon the analytics tools that we use today started to emerge. And they emerged for a very, very good reason, which was that this data seemed to hold out the promise of answering that question that's been troubling the marketing world since David Ogilvy said it in, I think, the 50s. Half my money on, I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is, I don't know which half. And our systems seem to hold out the promise of answering that. Now, in this room, we're all quite sophisticated, and we've just spent two days hearing about lots of problems with that data and how we can sort of try and solve them. But what we've got involved in, I would argue, is something a bit like an arms race, which is basically saying, always, if we could just have more data, somehow we could succeed in knowing everything and making people do what we want, bending them to our will, as that Dilbert cartoon showed just now. I'd argue this is actually chasing rainbows. This is, it's very, very important work, and I'm not saying don't do it, but I'm saying that we're getting sort of sidetracked by some of this, and the effect of being sidetracked is that we're investing yet more money. In fact, you know, here's, here's a nice little example of why I think the tools are forgetting about the people. 
we all know about email. We know that people read emails on their mobile, well, sorry, see an email on their mobile device, and then, like the offer, delete it unread, visit the site later on a different device. We know about that. We conduct sophisticated holdout tests to deal with this. Most of the time we do, or we should. But at the same time, in all our tools, we still see reported as top-line metrics, opens and clicks, and we use them for trending, we use them in lots of ways, while knowing that the data isn't really what a, a general-purpose layman might think it was. So we get this problem, nicely capsulated, where's Ivan, thank you for, for, the, for the slide. Um, the, the picture of, of Avanash's slide, they're showing this very, very high bar where you've spent ever-increasing amounts on tools, ever-increasing amounts on implementation, ever-increasing amounts on sophisticated analysis before you start to get a payoff. So what I'm, and there, there is a nice quote that I saw just before coming out here. Somebody explaining that 40 billion was spent on advertising in the US market and about 5 billion on what people got to see when they came and interacted with our site. So we're over-promising, spending a fortune to get to people and then disappointing and frustrating them when they get there. So I'm suggesting, don't, not stopping doing any of this, I just want to see a bit of a rebalance towards understanding the real person behind this data and what it is, why they're coming, what they want to do, how that intersects with the, uh, the purpose of the site, the business interests of the organisation. And by doing so, that is how I think you can get a quicker return on investment. So my first real key point is just a simple, very high level strategic point. Start thinking about people and what they're doing on the sites and not just how to get to them. And with this in mind, since I'm talking about trying to think about people and understand people, what I would say is let's extend that original phrase about recruit uh, analysts for curiosity. I would say a very valuable quality to try and recruit for is empathy. The ability to view your own site, or I, I use the word site, but these days I mean apps, I mean anything and everything. View your own digital material through somebody else's eyes. It's difficult to do, and I'm suggesting today, I'm going to show you some tactics for using data to provide the clues which will help you do so. Of these three points, the most important one is that third one. The tactic and process I'm going to talk about is the one of pulling together all the different systems, to a certain extent integrating them technically, but don't get sucked down that path. What I'm really talking, well, I'm not sucked down it too, path, too far, what I'm really talking about is the mental process of pulling together different strands of information and turning what might be clues and opinions into actual, into, into data. So I'm really saying, don't go fishing. In this cartoon, you've got a bloke who's dropped his little fishing line down into an unknown sea of data and will occasionally pull something out that might be nice to eat. Meanwhile, a competitor who's doing things a lot better can come along and eat the entire business while you're not looking. So, I need to talk about what, uh, what we've got. Now, yesterday, round the fire, we were talking about personas and the horrible truth about personas. Could I just have a raise of, uh, sort of, stick your hand up. Do you know what personas are, or do I have to talk about this? People know, good. Big show of hands. Now, who actually uses them, really, and gets some value out of it? That's more than I thought. There's three, and I'll put my hand up. There's four, because I really do, and I'll explain how we do it, and I'll give you an example. One point I'd make about personas is um, these are not just fictions. For this to work, you have to base your personas on data. Actually, use the data in ways that I'm going to talk about to build those personas. They've got to relate to people you, you can actually, to some extent, identify within your data. Otherwise, you know, they're just fairy stories, and that's why most people don't bother using them. So what else have we got? We've got GA, uh, the usual, where people came from, not as much of that as we used to, used to have, what they did. I'm not actually going to spend a lot of time talking about GA, and for GA, please read SiteCat, uh, AT Internet, whatever. I'm mostly going to talk about non-GA, but at this point I will mention one, one relevant place to look in GA. 
If you've got the demographic reporting, that is worth having. It's worth having a look. It's not hugely fine-grained. Probably works best if you're in a fairly busy site in a fairly busy vertical. It's worth a look. I'm going to come back to demographics in a different way uh, later on. I'm mostly going to be talking about seeking clues in other sources of data. Um, that's where I think uh, the gain to be, uh, to be had is, and then mixing that in with GA. Another reason I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about GA is that people in this week, uh, lots of people have said more interesting things than I ever could. I would also point out, though, last year, Carmen Medeiros did a wonderful presentation here. There's the link um, about getting visitor, visitor intent clues out of Google Analytics. That is so good that I really do urge you to have a look at that one. I've stolen one slide out of it, which is the one that shows these two circles, because that's really what I'm talking about here. You've got, on one side, you've got the visitor's intent, their agenda, what they are coming to do. On the other side, you've got the organisation's intent, their agenda, and what they associate with money. And it's only where those two happen to coincide that you've actually got the opportunity to make some money. And what I'm talking about is trying to understand how to make that overlap bigger. Um, me being me, I'm going to talk about uh, voice of customer surveys. They're top of the list because they are the gold standard. They are the best, best way of getting information uh, for, the, for these purposes. The reason they're so strong is that they're so quick and they're so direct, people tell you things. But in the context of this year's presentation, the most important point is point three on that, that it's the real, if you've got free text comments, and you must, um, the words are from real people. Reading words that real people wrote is the best way to start building up your mind and picture, your mental picture of what this person is like, what they think should be happening on your site, why they're here and what they want to do. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I can't resist showing you this. This is for, for Jeff, Jeff Sorrell. To add to his gallery of shame, that happened in January to a guy on the Ecom Chat Twitter group, James Gerd. He was shopping on a UK site half in the sales in January. Halfway through the checkout, they seriously popped an invitation on him. I mean, please don't do anything like that. Do perhaps use these things. If you're going to get intent from, or session intent from people who aren't going to buy, then having the little feedback survey invitations that are there is one of your fewer hopes of getting at it. Um, but the response rates on these things are very, very low. To briefly mention from last year, the ones that I think are really good and valuable and are the secret weapon, because most people don't use these and don't understand how big the response rates are, are the post-conversion surveys. The reason they're so strong is you aren't interrupting people. They're in the, they've done what they want. They have completed their agenda. And they are therefore in a more generous position and will tell you lots. And they will tell you about things that happened on non-converting visits. But the thing I need to emphasize here very much is this has to be processed in a process-driven way. You have to work with these on a regular business cycle, rather like the split testing point that Craig was making. Full weeks every week or full months every month. You must put them through some kind of process. I advocate tagging them according to themes and then summarizing themes and reporting on them. But the main point here is not so much literally what you do with them, is the fact that you do do it and that you do it on a business process driven basis. Because if you don't, then I, I argue that it's really still just opinion. It's subjective, it's what you'll remember the things you want to remember and you'll forget all the other things that people are actually telling you quite loudly. So it's the point, the point here is that the process is, turns the sort of opinion into, into data. Another point about these that I'm going to repeat, uh, but emphasize a different point this year, is integrate them if you can, technically, into GA, for example. Send session IDs into GA so that you can actually find the sessions that uh, had that survey in it. If you're doing session recording, that's another very powerful thing to do with that. Uh, send in something into GA because suddenly you're going to have information that people voluntarily gave you. So not PII, don't put comments in it, free comments, or else they'll give you PII by mistake. But other stuff into GA, real people data into GA, that transforms the power of what you can do there. If I had to choose only one thing, it would be purpose of visit. If I got 
the option of having two, I would say, purpose of visit and task completion. Those two transform it all. And once you do this, once you have this ability to go from a comment in GA to, uh, sorry, a comment in the survey, over to GA to see that session or to see the page they're complaining about, possibly the ability to then look at it as a, a, on, a, on a session recording, then you're fishing like this. This is what real fishermen, commercial fishermen actually use. These are two separate displays. On the left, it's showing you horizontally where the fish are in relation to you and the speed. On the right, it's showing you the depth between you, the, where the fish are sort of vertically. And the point I want to make about this is the human being, not the system, interprets this data, these two sets of clues, and because they know the size and speed of the fish and the depth they're going at, they can actually tell what the fish are. So they can pick and choose and say, I'm going after that lot because that's what I need to be catching. Go through the process of sort of triangulating your data and mixing it together, and you can do the same process. You can learn a lot more about people from clues. You know, picking up on Steen's presentation from yesterday where he had his crime scene and all that stuff, this is where you do your sort of detective work. You've got a load of separate circumstantial clues, you pull them together, and you gain insights. So that is my second key point, is the tactic is the point here. Join things together, turn the circumstantial evidence, which is sort of like opinion, into something that is much closer to actual data that you can work with. I mentioned session recording. Uh, just to be clear, these are not the sort of uh, you know, like usability test recordings. This is the stuff where you're putting a bit of JavaScript on and it's recording the clicks as people move around where their mouse click. Or, good example, I hope you can see it, this is session cam. That's a touch screen recording. They are showing at various points the two fingers touching and pinching and zooming and so on. Nice thing that they do, from my triangulation point of view, is if you pass their ID into GA, they have a widget, uh, a widget for Chrome, uh, which then allows you to get a custom report, find that session, click on a button, and it pops that little display there up within GA. Not literally that one, but it opens it in, a, I think, an overlay. Um, I only just discovered about that, so I confess this is a thing where I've not used it, but I'm just so, you know, so keen to try that. The other thing that's important about session recordings is they've got to be searchable, so that if somebody tells you there's a problem on a particular page, you can then go and find recordings that include it. Clicktail, who are one of the original providers of this, do a very, very nice thing with this. They have the ability that you find a page on which you, you want to investigate, and you can watch like a showreel of session after session after session of people just using that page, which can be a form of torture. So that is a very, very useful technique for troubleshooting. Again, taking feedback, possibly from a feedback survey, possibly from a high abandon rate or exit rate from a page in GA, and saying, I will then go and look at the session recording to see if I can deduce from that what people are doing. Uh, those vendors also do scroll maps and all that stuff. That's where they originally began doing. That has some uses in this world, but to be honest, I don't think it's as good as the, the session recording stuff. Real usability tests are, of course, hugely important as well. Very valuable. When I say real ones, I'm talking about moderated ones. The point I'm making in those two pretty pictures is not so much that they've got expensive eye-tracking technology. It's that there are two people in each picture. Um, you've got, you recruit real people, real users if you can, or at least people who are closely matched your demographic. can be very expensive and difficult to do in some markets. Hugely worthwhile to do it. And then you and your team, ideally, but also a professional uh, specialist in doing this, are watching them, observing them, participating in the sessions, understanding all the non-verbal stuff that's going on, and you also get the ability to uh, debrief people afterwards. This is hugely valuable stuff. Very expensive to do, very worthwhile. Unmoderated ones, you can send invitations out rather than, don't use the panels for this. Panels is for just general usability issues. For this type of purpose, don't use their panels, but you can use their systems if you want by sending out invitations. But if you do that, you might as well just go and use a system-only tool like uh, Open Hallway, or there are lots of others. Important link on this page, these are all downloadable afterwards. There's a link to download the deck on the, uh, on the last slide. Up at the top there, 
are a couple of links to the UK government developed what they call GDS, Government <coughs> Digital Services Team. That is a complete honeypot for everybody in this room. They have, they share everything and everything they do. They share a huge amount of data on it as well. There are resources there on how to buy all these tools. Not specifically saying go and get this, that and the other. They are all the resources of what you, the checklists of what you need to consider. Loads and loads of stuff. How to set up your usability studio, what colour to paint the walls. Every, everything is in there. But an interesting point about them and their rules, and one of them is they have a rule that everybody working on one of their sites now is supposed to spend two hours every six weeks watching users on the site. They have to watch people. And they claim, read their blogs, they claim that they actually make people do this and they get compliance. <coughs> Onwards, I said I would talk about demographics. I'm trying to really hack through this so we get back onto schedule. Demographics, I mean real demographic data. I'm saying if you've got a customer file that contains addresses so to make this possible, then you need to go to one of the very expensive agencies, certainly expensive in my country, that do this, who match it up, profile it against their very expensive database of addresses and so on, and tell you who these people actually are, with very fine grain in my country anyway, about who these people are very likely to be. Because this can be an absolute shocker. This is where data really can beat opinion. And I will give you an example of that that's very much in my mind at the moment because it's just happened. One of my clients sells toys. Uh, they built a website thinking that these toys were being bought by parents for the children because that's what they had observed in shops. They also had this really good scheme where they sold these things. They're sort of vaguely right on. They sold them through schools. So again, when they went to schools, they observed parents buying these things. So that was their assumption and they built a site for parents to buy toys. Their demographics revealed two huge, the, the site, users, customers on the site were dominated by two groups. One of, neither of whom had children. One were elderly people living in sort of places associated with retirement, literally in retirement homes sometimes. That's easy, you figure that out. It's the grandparents, okay, no problem. The other were very affluent young people living in areas like, you know, trendy people like, uh, people like ourselves, young affluent Londoners living in Silicon Roundabout, in loft apartments, no bedrooms, no children, clearly. Who the hell were they? And they finally figured these out. These are the aunts and uncles, possibly, but also friends, friends of the parents. So the key point here is they built a site for parents who knew lots and lots about their children. It's full of all the appropriate material. It's being, bought, it's being used by people who are buying gifts. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but I can certainly remember that when I, my brothers and sisters first had, started having children, I was interested in other things. I couldn't have told you. Yeah, it's, it's a boy, definitely a boy. So he's, is he three or is he five? Could be six. You know, I, d I didn't have a clue. Um, and the site needed to be geared up for that. It was get the right present that people are going to, it's a big expensive present, get the right one. But the content needed to change completely. It wasn't being used by parents. Right, going back to GA and what we've got in there, we've got less and less data about where people are coming from, so I won't spend much time on that, and a bit more that we have on what people are doing on the sites. The trouble with, with a bit more is it's coming at a great expense. This is, again, cost and implementation, in this case, to get it. On who people, where people are coming from, one of the things we heard yesterday was a suggestion about having a playbook for, for your tagging campaigns. I think that's a really good idea, and I would like to inject something kind of difficult into that, which is that campaigns are typically aimed at people, but if you didn't manage that campaign or aren't a specialist that, in that area and looked at the data in GA, you wouldn't have a clue from the tags as to who these people are. For perfectly understandable reasons, the tag tagging schemes we all use are actually designed to suit the management structure of whatever channel it is. And I'm not arguing that you should change that. In the case of things like AdWords, of course, there is financial considerations here. To get your best cost per acquisition, you need to structure your, uh, your AdWords accounts in various ways that people can advise you on and have different theories about. So you can't mess with that, but I'm saying if in the medium term you could try and encode into this some kind of hints about whether this is upper funnel research visitors that you're targeting, any clues about who these people are, 
into GA, into a human readable form that can be read by someone else, in the long term that investment would be worthwhile doing. I'm only suggesting it as an idea. I'm not saying that you can do it very quickly. I recognise you can't. So within the sort of search world, the only thing that we've got that's hugely relevant to what I'm talking about these days is matched search query. Well worth looking at, you know, what were they searching for and where, you know, where did they land? That's of some use. That kind of thing, though, actually crops up quite nicely within the behaviour reports. Um, of this lot, I used to always have flow reports and uh, things like navigation summary as demoted as things that were of very little practical use in re most real cases. Great for troubleshooting, not for this what are people doing type thing. Real time suck for trying to work out what people are doing. That has changed to quite a considerable extent. I think content grouping has changed that. I think content grouping is a hugely, hugely important addition to the GA sort of toolkit. Fiddly to do, expensive to do, but very well worthwhile because suddenly even something like the good old navigation summary, an ancient GA report suddenly starts to work if it's done like this. There's an example. What you can see there is somebody, it's a, it's a subcategory page. People came from subcategory, they too were on the subcategory, they went to another subcategory. You can deduce here that people are moving through subcategory after subcategory trying to spot something and arguably probably not, not succeeding too well. You've also got evidence of this thing of Poe going up and down, people going from subcategory down to the product level, back up again, down again. Lots of evidence of that. So there is information here about your navigation structure and how people are using it. So when they're grouped, I think those reports start to have some, some sense. So I urge you to do that. Site search, again, a bit like the match search query. Here's another case where we've got people uh, coming into the site uh, who are eventually changing to search. So we've got the words that they searched for and where they search for them. So that's two points. Uh, that's well worth having. That pairing of things can reveal things about people. Pairing is also very, very good with landing page and second page view. That combination is good for clues. That, of course, crops up quite a bit. As um, I've got it, I'm showing here on the, uh, repeating the point about Carmen slides. That technique was originally really pioneered as a solution to the not provided problem. It's actually quite useful with everything, not just organic search. So it's well worth having a look at that. The other thing to consider very much for this purpose within GA is segmentation. I'm not talking here very much about user segments, and you will note that I haven't even tried to talk about using, uh, stitching together users using ID, user ID. I'm leaving that entirely for Charles later to explain why, that, why the technical solution here is yet to really be worthwhile. User segments are a bit like that, I think. They're dangerous, slightly, because they give you the impression that the illusion that you have a complete picture when we in our... <laughs> Honest minds in this room know that this picture is only partial. It's really, most of the time, only just per device. So although using your professional skills you can interpret it, the, the risk is that you actually take it for granted uh, as being what it says it is. The things that I think are particularly important are sequence segments for this. So you can do the equivalent of the landing page and second page. You can build up sequence segments, and it's by doing that that I think you could actually pursue the dream only a dream, again, I'm planting an idea here, that you could actually create segments that might match these persona types that you've created and actually say, we are identifying you know, John Doe or Jane Smith or whatever you want to call them and actually label segments and get people starting to think in those terms. Have a go. It's worth the effort to explore these things, I think. The other similar thing is setting up micro-conversion goals, by which I don't mean the ones for things like add to cart or view basket cart page or started checkout. What I'm talking about here is upper funnel, for example, in the case upper funnel visits. What might be an appropriate goal for somebody who you've bought to, uh, for, on a research visit? If you can find goals that are appropriate for that person, for, for example, you can't actually set up goals based on content groups yet, and I don't know whether you ever will be, but you can use regular expressions to sort of fake something like that. 
So if you could set up goals that are appropriate to people conducting early research visits, then that is a very, very useful technique, I think, for these purposes. Because what I'm trying to do here is say, let's look at the other, you know, 95, 98% of visit sessions to our, on our site which don't convert and try and get our heads into the heads of these people and what they're doing. Upper funnel goals, for example, might be a very good technique for that. And the other thing that these micro-conversion goals are very good for is you can use them with go um, reverse goal report. I know that in his latest post, Avinash has said reverse goal is useless. I'm going to have to differ with him on that because reverse goal, I believe, has a wonderful use. It's good for understanding how people get to a goal when what you are trying to find out is how they get there. What are the common routes to doing it? I showed it last year, and I'll repeat it here, in the context of tracking errors. So you set up a goal for an error, and you can see how people got there. If you had a suitable error for a, an upper funnel research visit, how did people get to that? That's an interesting point. What are the common routes that get people to what you consider to be the appropriate thing? How can you speed it up and make it easier for people to do that? Since I am talking about analytics to include to improve user experience and people's experiences. I will bring this presentation to a close by reprising one point from that, which is, of course, that tracking errors is a good way of bringing about improvements, a short, quick way of bringing improvements about. I'll skip through those examples of the type of things you might track, because uh, you can download the slides. I will focus in on this. This is, the, what I, this is an example of checkout errors. And the point I would make here is that since we're talking about people, when you're using this technique, you must then drill down or segment by different types of people. And what we get here is what happens if you look just at email users. It makes sense that they come along and then they fail to log in. They have password problems. It seems very odd that people coming from email should then get an error because they're trying to set up to use the email to create a, create a new account. But this brings me back to the, where I started with the record industry. Because we're tending to see, you know, if you look at that and say, well, that's daft, that's user error, they made a mistake, then you are guilty, just as I am often, we all are, of seeing the world from the perspective of our site. How could this person, who actually last visited the site over a year ago, but we're still sending them emails, how could this person have forgotten their email, that they have an account with us. They, surely they would remember. Of course they wouldn't. They've spent an entire, more than a year, nowhere near your company, not thinking about your brand. So I think we tend to see the, uh, the internet um, a bit like this. This is a cartoon from the cover of the New Yorker in 1976 by Saul Steinberg. It's called The View of the World from Ninth Avenue. It could be the same in London. Trust me, it would be exactly the same in London. What you see here is at the front you've got 9th Avenue, then you've got a block, then you've got 10th Avenue, and then beyond that there's another block, a few more blocks, and eventually there's Hudson River. On the other side, visibly identified is Jersey. It's on the radar, you know Jersey. There's this other band, which is, actually that's the rest of America. Then there's the Pacific, and in the distance there's this thing called Russia, and there's another one called China. Funny little things. I think a lot of e-commerce teams, including me, we tend to view our world a bit the same. We have this thing called the home page, which is huge, and then there's this checkout, which looms very large in our existence. And there are these other things called product pages, which, in my experience, get far less attention, even though, if you think about real people on our sites, the only bit of it they're interested in the products is the products. That's the only reason they might be there. They have no interest in anything else. Your one hope is that they are interested in your products and that they are going to go ahead and buy them. So I think we get even that bit a little bit wrong. But then we have this gap, and then we have this big thing we obsess about called Google, and another big thing on our minds is Facebook. Only some of us you know, get to look at, think about rival sites, and then tiny, the rest of the web, and the non-web internet, all the things that people do online which are completely different and are changing radically all around us, and we're still looking at clicks, clicks on websites, and the world is changing radically, and yet we still tend to view it in this way, which sounds very negative. But all I'm arguing is think about it differently. And floating around these days somewhere, oh, it didn't even show up. Oh, well. There is mobile 
this grey nebulous figure, I think supposed to be floating around somewhere and we don't know quite what they are and where they fit in. So to conclude, I'm really saying this. If you can only do one thing, it's the strategy. It's to sort of think, think, think about people. Try and understand, try and view your world as other people see it. And that is the big secret to success. The one tactic, since it's about people, is I'm flogging this away like mad, is please do the feedback survey thing. But if you do it, you have to do it in the process-driven way. If you don't do the process-driven way, don't bother with the feedback thing. It's the two together that work. And if you do that, Carmen circles will go like this. They'll, the overlap, you'll get information which will help you increase that overlap and get you some good results. And the last slide, there it is. You can download all of this from up there. There are some very nice resources up there, including an <laughs> servicate.com, a uh, thing that I only heard about around the fire yesterday, which looks like a very, very interesting feedback tool to go and consider. And there's also a mention to Dan Barker, who's got an, another very interesting tool in the pipeline. Anyway, I hope we're vaguely back on time. Thank you. Thank you.